Now, I, uh, I, I knew what I was going to talk about today and I've changed my mind. Um, because I was, I've, one thing is, I've been watching the speeches and when you see these presentations, there is, I hope that you out there have had the same thing which I have on an almost daily basis, that when you see someone who is either talking about cosmology, the nature of the brain, or, or perhaps saying that when they were 14, they came up with an idea that may well cure pancreatic cancer, <laughs> you get just a little bit of mind envy. You know that? You kind of look and you go, how does your brain work? I want a brain like that. And, and that's what I love. This is what I, I've decided I'm going to talk about, which is the excitement of... I mean, I met... This is a thing uh, a couple of weeks ago. I won't say who, but I met a Nobel Prize winning uh, chemist and, and had a fantastic time as well because uh, there are few more exciting things in the world than seeing a Nobel Prize winner unable to work out how a taxi door opens. And it was... <laughs> It was, I'm not going to say who it was. Maybe a couple of drinks later, I will reveal. But he, it was this beautiful moment where he got, oh, yes, you've changed humanity. But look, I'm in here. So... <laughs> but I, I get... In fact, this is another thing as well. I got in mind envy uh, back in uh, at the Edinburgh Science Festival. I was up there, and, uh, and I got the chance to meet Peter Higgs, who is, of course, a, a remarkable individual. And uh, there was, it, was, it was great. But basically, a friend of mine said, would you like to come out for dinner with Peter Higgs? As if I'm going to go, no... He's not on my list of Nobel Prize winning physicists I was hoping to meet, but thanks, right? So I said yes, and then the moment I said yes, I thought, oh no, do not say anything, right? Because I am an idiot on a broad array of topics, right? Some people are just they're happy to stay ignorant, but I've read just enough to be wrong on a lot of things, right? <laughs> And particle physics is one of my special areas of being wrong. And, and I kind of, that, that thing, that, that prescience that we have in the human mind, where I would, each day I was just kind of thinking of that moment where I'd be sitting there and going, uh, Peter, I was told this about muons and gluons. Were you? Well, it's very wrong. <laughs> you must be an idiot. Yes, I am. I'm so sorry. Why did Brian Cox tell me that? <laughs> no one would believe I misled him. I'm so pretty. But anyway, so the, uh... <laughs> I hope this isn't being filmed. Uh, the, uh, so, so, and actually, this is one of the things as well. Why I love, I, I love Peter Higgs's mind, and, and many people's minds. One of the things, he's a fantastic reminder of the delayed gratification of human knowledge. We live in a time where there are many things that are very, very immediate. We want things immediately. And then when you see Peter Higgs, 50 years ago, he came up with an idea. And people went, that's a very good idea, Peter. That's a very good idea. Do you know what we're going to do? We're going to start digging underneath Switzerland, and some of France as well, and then when we've got something about 27 kilometres round, we're going to start creating machines which are currently almost beyond the human imagination, and uh, then we're going to start sending round bundles of particles at speeds near that of light. I hope you're right. <laughs> and that's the great thing. 50 years later, they go, well done, Peter, you were right. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm old now. How strange. That's... So this is the thing, I, I am a huge fan, this is, in fact, I'll show you, right, because otherwise, I, I, I said I'd show this right at the beginning, right? So I want to start off, I am going to show you uh, my brain, right? I had a brain scan just for fun. I met a man on a train and he said, would you like a brain scan? And I said, yeah, that sounds fun. And genuinely, that's what I'm like. I, I think life's probably finite. And uh, so just say yes. And he said, I might be anyone. I said, well, it's all fun, isn't it? And I... I might have just ended up in his shed, lying in a bin while he banged magnets around it, just going, oh, this is an MRI, would you like to live in my well? Anyway, so, so I went, and that's my brain, that is, uh, and, and it, was, it was one of the most exciting moments, right, this sounds like a boast, it's not really, uh, uh, the, the woman who was doing the brain scan, apparently, when I was in the scanner, went, oh my God, his brain's so big, I'm not sure I can fit it all in! <laughs> and then blushed, right, now. Very little about outside me has ever made anyone blush. The fact that my slightly larger occipital lobe finally did it. And, uh, and I'm not showing off, obviously, because most of you will probably know this, that within a certain range, the size of the brain, it, it, it doesn't really make much difference. I mean, Albert Einstein had a smaller brain than me. But you know what? I think he had the intellectual edge. So it's... <laughs> so the thing about that brain that you just saw is that from looking at that, there's, you can tell things... I mean, one of the reasons, by the way, that I show it now quite a lot, that's the fourth time I've shown it, is because I know that in an audience like this, there'll be some experts in, so I'm always double-checking that I'm OK. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm terribly sorry, there was something they didn't notice. Oh, dear, it's only a short tour. Anyway, so the... Um, 
But I do, you look at the... There are so... First of all, right, the human brain. One of the things that I love about the human brain is the things that we forget. It's the most complex thing in the known universe, right? And the good news about that, by the way, is we still don't know a lot of the universe. So there may be more complex things. I'm sure you've all had a, a Friday night wandering around the streets and occasionally gone, I'm not sure that's the behaviour of the most complex thing in the known universe, right? So there's... <laughs> But it is every single one of you inside your skull, you have the most complex thing in the known universe. And, and you achieve things that you don't think about, things that are beyond most other creatures. When you wake up in the morning, if you look in a mirror, the fact that you don't immediately go, ah, what are you doing there? Get out, get out, get out. Why are you always here? <laughs> Hopefully is... <laughs> That's a remarkable achievement. Most animals cannot do that. The, uh, the chimpanzee can recognise itself in a mirror. The orangutan can recognise itself in a mirror. The beluga whale can recognise itself in a mirror. And I'd like to say now, well done, scientists. That was a lot of effort. Uh, the... <laughs> Then there's a lot of other, and most animals can't. I mean, if you put a capuchine monkey in a cage with a mirror, all it will do for the month that it's in there is just keep going up to the mirror and going... <laughs> At no point in that month does it go, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> oh, I'm seeing a bit of a pattern. Oh, I see. Silly. <laughs> that doesn't occur, right? <laughs> then there are other remarkable... Because that's, that's also one of the problems. We are self-aware. We are aware of our own existence, which is... I mean, I'll, I'll get on to that in a minute if I've got the time. I've just looked at the clock. That's not looking good. And so the... Uh, but... <laughs> It is, it is this fantastic thing, which is uh, the, Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist. He, uh, he once met a monk, and the monk was... So they were talking about human knowledge. And he said, you always have to remember that the keys to heaven also open the gates to hell. Right, uh, which is a very bad security system. Uh, you, would, <laughs> you would have thought an omnipotent deity would have come up with something better than that. Than, uh, You've used the same key. Well, I wasn't expecting to be so evil. He's had all the milk. But it's... Um, <laughs> But that is something we need to remember, which is some of the... I mean, one of the beautiful things we have is the fact that most of our brain doesn't even know we exist, right? The you-ness of you, the me-ness of me, that is just the top of the brain there, something I think it was once described as thick as Christmas cake icing. There is the you-ness of you. And then the rest of it is your brain is just getting on with all of the other things to keep this in existence, right? A lot of what your brain is doing is stopping you doing things that you'll never even know you were ever possibly going to do, right? A lot of a day is just your brain going, no, not here, not in this shopping centre. <laughs> Did he do it? No, he didn't. Should we tell him? Never, shush, right? So that's, <laughs> that's an exciting thing to have going on. And so with that as well, the extra thing that we have on top of that is we have this fantastic thing, which is we have an inner monologue. We have a way of viewing the world that can make the world beautiful. It helps altruism and empathy and all of the very best sides of humanity. It also creates paranoia and fear. There are wonderful things about the fact that, for instance, you know, when most animals die, they leave behind skin and blood and bones and maybe eventually a fossil. Whereas when we die, we might leave all those things, but we also leave behind some of the machinations of our mind, some of our thoughts. I mean, they, they, these books, which I have no idea how boring they were expecting some of the speeches to be, but these books here, right, which is uh, all classics, by the way, there's uh, First Aid from the St. John Ambrose Station, here's Whip Hand by Victor Canning, all, uh, all great Ted tomes. And, but inside, that's a very bad example, actually, inside those books, are some of the thoughts of human beings. They are, when I read Carl Sagan's Demon Haunted World, and I, I feel sad that Carl Sagan, the great cosmologist, is no longer with us, but I think, ah, there is still some of the machinations of his mind. It, it, it is almost, they are fossils of the mind. When you die, you will leave behind, they might be letters or journals, postcards, diaries, whatever it might be, even a book. And those things, they are some of the things that your mind made, something of you. And that's, that's one of the reasons that I love books. I adore books because they give you the chance to... Well, well I was in a, in a second... In fact, my agent recently said, you've now made the leap from bibliophile to bibliosexual, right? I, uh, I, when I go into a second-hand bookshop, I, I can't... I, I actually get so many, and then sometimes I arrive home and go, oh, my God, my wife's home early. What am I going to do? I have actually hidden books under our shed, right? So... <laughs> 
But the reason that I love that journey is I, I was down at a, a, a bookshop in Cornwall uh, on the coast and I, went, I bought a book by Colin Blakemore, who you might know, a neuroscientist. It was a book called Mechanics of the Mind and it was based on his wreath lectures from the 1970s. And I was sitting on the train to Truro and I was just reading this book and I was really enjoying thinking Colin Blakemore's still with us, by the way, but I was thinking here are the machinations of Colin Blakemore's mind, his mind creating ideas about the mind. And then I turned a page and I found out I had a double whammy because this didn't only contain the machinations of Colin Blakemore's mind. Also, it turned out in the margins was the angry, inky scribble of an academic who clearly didn't like the cut of Colin Blakemore's jib, right? <laughs> So I turn to page seven and suddenly in the margin it just goes, this young man's beginning to annoy me. <laughs> turn the next page, he started to cross out what he considers to be extraneous words. <laughs> the next page just has a sip, goes, he doesn't even seem to understand gravity and buttered toast, exclamation mark. <laughs> page 53, it just says really angry, it goes, I'm going to stop reading now. <laughs> but he didn't. And it's, those are the parts, so that's what we have, the, the, the keys to heaven, which is we are able to create these thoughts and we're able to put them on paper and we have this in model. The downside of it as well, the thing that we have to fight against, I am very lucky, right, my life is I kind of hang around with people who, generally I'm a little bit of a freak, right, I hang around with uh, charmingly freakish and weird people and we can kind of express ourselves and we're not too worried about the judgement of others. Uh, I mean, we're always a little bit worried, of course. Uh, but other people, it, it, it can be harder, and sometimes you have to keep a lot of things in. And these are the thoughts, because thoughts will take you by surprise. You will sometimes have a thought and you'll think, oh, I didn't think that was the kind of person I was. Where's that come from, right? And this is, well, this is, I'll give you a classic example. Sometimes they're called the imp of the mind. Sometimes they're called the imp of the perverse. These are the thoughts that disconcert you, discombobulate you. Right? I'll give you the classic example. The classic example is when you're holding a baby. Now, it might be your baby, it might be someone else's baby. And while you're holding the baby, you just happen to be at the top of some stairs, or by an open window, or near a cliff, right? <laughs> and you're holding the baby, and just suddenly you go, ah! Oh my God, I just imagined throwing the baby out the window. <laughs> I must be insane, I must be a madman, I must be a baby killer. Oh, what am I gonna do? Uh, Jilly, Jilly, do you want to take Alfie back? I, uh, oh, just my arms are a bit tired, that's all I... <laughs> I didn't just imagine throwing him out that window. I, you want him back, okay, right. So those. Now, because this is TEDx, I want to find out who here has had those thoughts, right? And uh, this is very important, by the way. The first one I'm going to ask you, the thought is, oh my God, I just imagined throwing the baby out the window. Not, I just imagined throwing the baby out the window. <laughs> no time for that one. So, can't you see how many people here are holding their own baby or someone else's have had that thought? See? It's never been, I've asked this now about 25 times, it has never been that many. That is fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's normally about 10%. And congratulations to the front, by the way, because the front is always, that's the least likely area, because people have learnt from experience of the risk, which is, well, of course, we all do. I, oh, the, uh, <laughs> tonight, they all do. I can't believe it, right? This is... But this is the thing, is when for a lot of people, when I've been touring around and I've been talking about this, there are people who put their hands up, there's a small group, 5 10%, and they do look quite worried. What does it mean? Now, I'm going to explain what it means. I've read some kind of psychiatry, I, I, I've spoken to people who've examined this condition. So for those of you, nearly 50%, I think, today, who put your hands up, and the balcony, of course, a very risky area, the... Uh, <laughs> It is actually right, so you know, and hopefully this will help you in the future, hopefully this will help you when you're at christening or anything like that. What you need to know about you and the way you hold a baby is that you, that 50%, are the best people to hold a baby. You are the least likely people to throw a baby out the window. You are the people who think ahead. When it comes to holding a baby, you are a safe pair of hands. <laughs> the... The other 50%, I have no idea how you've got this far, to be quite honest. You, you don't think, you're the kind of people who go, I wonder what would happen if... Oh, it hasn't worked out very well, has it? That's, uh... <laughs> but this is, again, part of the beauty. We are a prescient creature. We have theory of mind. We are able... So what is going on? That moment where you sometimes go, oh, I wasn't expecting that thought, that is actually your brain delivering in a slightly cat-handed way the information of saying, 
By the way, just so you remember, don't chuck the baby out the window. Oh, I delivered that story in a bit of a... I think he thinks he wants to now. Oh, never mind. Right, so that's, that's what... And you can have lots of these different thoughts. They are, you know, to, again, to arm you to know that you should not be scared of these thoughts. They are, you know, sometimes you're on a very busy train station and you have freight trains going through, and as the freight trains going through, if they go through very fast, sometimes you have that little moment where you go, well, I didn't think I felt suicidal, but... <laughs> Same time, I don't trust my own legs not to play a trick on me. I'll, I'll just hold on to this bench for a while. That's uh, the safest thing to do. There's a more psychotic one. That one, sometimes there's someone in front of you and you go, oh, I don't like him and I don't like his ringtone. <laughs> Who's going to know? You know, the... Uh, I, uh, the worst thing was I started reading a book about these because I thought it would help. I thought, good, this will help me with my imps of the mind. It kind of did, but at the same time, it's fed my imp. So, I used to just have a couple of imps, the baby thing, the train station thing. Chapter one of the book says, one of the most common imps of the mind is when seeing someone walking a dog in front of you and imagining yourself in a sexual situation with the dog. <laughs> well, it wasn't. I'd never had that before, right? Now you've got it as well. This is... I got off the train at Nottingham, like, oh, no, now I'm going to go the long way round. It's ridiculous, right? <laughs> so that is, I've, I've run out of time, so I will just say, this, this to me is that, right, we have the most complex thing in the known universe. There are so many wonderful things. I mean, the, the fact that these things exist, and everyone who organises something like the wonderful TEDx at Salford, right, here is the beautiful thing that we, as creatures, we have the most complex thing in the known universe. Do not waste it. You know, if, if you are watching television and you are watching something that you can actually make in your own house, don't bother watching it, just make it, right? There's a lot of television where you go, oh good, I'm watching a panel of idiots being idiots just so I can be angry on Twitter. Just be an idiot yourself. Be your own idiot in your own house. Make your own panel, right? This is, you know, so many of the legends and the myths that we have uh, warn about curiosity. You know, whether it might be Prometheus, whether it might be the story of Adam and Eve, whether it's Doubting Thomas. Curiosity, to me, is the greatest act of rebellion, right? Not kind of drink or drugs or any of those things. The greatest act of rebellion is to ensure that you have... I've just realised, by the way, that became a very fascistic delivery of... Uh, <laughs> But it's, yes, secret Ted suddenly showed. <laughs> you must all be curious, every one of you. <laughs> Question things. There must be no dogma. No dogma. <laughs> Doubt is vital. I'm going to end on that. Bye-bye. <laughs>